So uh, thank you for having me. Um, it's I think it's been maybe about two or three years since I, I was here last. And um, it's always a pleasure to be with a dermatologist uh, because I often get confused to be a dermatologist and I get a, a lot of cases sent to me that are vasculitic, like the ones you show me. And then I redirect them back to dermatology. So um, uh, ideally this um, lecture here, uh, let's see if I can just uh, fast forward. <laughs> There we go. So as you can see, uh, yes, my background is uh, uh, fairly diverse and um, <clears throat> it's actually been uh, not by design. Um, it's something that I've, I've stumbled into and it's been extremely useful in terms of uh, wound healing and uh, uh, dealing with really uh, complicated wounds um, uh, uh, thus far. So the goals of this objective, as you can see, is to discuss initially, what are the key wound healing principles? And then um, what are the factors that really delays healing? And then how do we overcome this? Um, and then we'll also look at some um, clinical cases in terms of uh, what are some ideas to consider um, when you're treating and managing uh, uh, complex wounds um, in your category. So um, the first half of the talk is going to be more sort of basic science, bread and butter wound care. And then later on, we'll do a lot more clinical cases. I think like 95% of all the cases I have here are dermatology cases. And um, uh, so hopefully, so hopefully that will keep your, uh, uh, your interest. I'll start off with a, a pretty interesting case that was sent to me. Um, as you can see here, this was a 89 year old elderly woman who had uh, primary cutaneous diffuse large cell uh, uh, B cell lymphoma. And um, it's, it's interesting in that as we talk about wound care and as we talk about healing, you really have to be sort of uh, attuned to the, the granular. And this is why I love dermatology, because when the residents from dermatology show up, unlike some of the other residents, you know, they want to know the specifics. They want to look at the wound closely and see what's going on. And that's what you that's the sort of hat you need to have in terms of dealing with very complicated wounds where most people might say, ah, this is something that you just need to do the amputation and move on. But it's not necessarily the case. And hopefully you'll see that. So this particular patient, elderly, um, uh, a significant uh, uh, morbidity from the um, uh, cancer standpoint, she was heavily radiated um, on the lower extremity, as you can see here. And and when we inherited her, um, she had had this defect uh, for quite some time. We're talking maybe four, five, six, seven months um, where uh, she had a, a number of different uh, methodologies have been attempted, vinegar soaks and these sorts of things. And, and it just wasn't progressing. And of course, given the fact that she had radiation exposure, you can only imagine the extra uh, 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 tissue trauma that you can have. Looking at this particular wound, you can see that the skin is very taut, right? She's also got all this, this layer of fibrosis there. Um, and yes, it does present a significant challenge. And the goal, as you'll see when we go through this uh, uh, talk, is to transform that base. Every single case, I don't care how challenging it is, my goal initially is to see how can I transform that base from looking like this into something a bit more granular, a bit more red, a bit more healthy. And the process of doing that is how we're able to get um, uh, uh, effective healing in, in, in a substantial number of our patients. So in the next um, uh, uh, box here, if you will, you can see I've started the process, right? You start seeing some healthy buds of granulation tissue start to appear. Even though she still has a heavy burden of, 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 of fibrinous, slothy type material, and yes, she still has this uh, uh, pretty large defect, we're starting to stimulate in a fairly short period of time some granular buds that are coming up. I always look at the wound, and, I, and, and when I'm looking at each wound, I'm looking for hints, signs of any health that might be there, because I'm going to enhance that. I'm going to go ahead and make uh, small micro debridements. And debridement comes in so many different flavors. It's not about necessarily taking your curette and scraping the wound in, in such a, a, a severe manner. Sometimes I call it just feathering the wound, where you take the curette and you gently just stimulate those cells. And, and, and basically, you'll see the transformation. So as time goes on, I'm doing that every single visit. And typically, these are weekly visits that the patient is coming in. And you can start seeing the population of a wound that was really dried, desiccated, and, um, uh, and especially, uh, again, having this burden of radiation 
she's slowly moving in the uh, in the correct direction. You can start seeing some epithelial buds starting, but look at the extent of granulation tissue that's starting on that base. When I see things like this, now I'm really, really excited because from a wound care closure perspective, now I can open up my pantry. There's so many different skin grafts if I need it, so many different biological products that I could use. But the key is throughout this lecture for you to understand that, yes, we have lots of different sub skin substitutes that we can use, but nothing works well like the basics. And once you have the basics in play and you have a beautiful, granular, healthy wound bed, your chances of success, even in a difficult wound, will be heightened. So again, we continue to stimulate her. We continue to debride her. And um, uh, uh, as you can see, the wound is contracting and uh, she continues to move on. I lose her in, in around April. And um, I lost her because her family had given up because she had, she had actually developed um, uh, some metastases um, where she required, uh, they just decided they were gonna put her in hospice care. And um, eventually she started having visual loss. And then I think things changed where she decided to get some more palliative radiation. They actually talked about maybe even considering radiating the leg. Fortunately, I think she had an additional biopsy, no additional cancer was found in the leg. Um, but she remained on hospice for quite some time. When she came back to me, this is her back, um, her return in, in, in uh, July. And you can see the wound had pretty much stalled again. Um, she had, um, uh, for the most part, they had continued with things like Dakin's or acetic um, uh, acid soaks. And, but I don't think they were, uh, patient was receiving any active debridement. So nothing to really stimulate the wound. So it, it went back into this sort of stalled uh, state and it stayed there until uh, July. So for whatever reason, she changes her code status and um, decides to move forward. And uh, we inherited her and we start the process again. So this is a good case to show you how important serial debridement is because without that debridement, the wound stalls. But once we reinitiate the debridement again from a, from a very gentle and judicious uh, fashion, you can see the transformation and she goes on and starts uh, re-exciting the cells. The, the epithelial cells start to populate and then she continues on. And yes, I, I'm, I'm not saying this was an easy case and you can see the time frame that it's taking. But what I want to uh, impress upon you is that with ongoing patients and serial micro debridements where you continue to wake up these senescent cells that we'll talk about, you can get the wound to actually transform and move on to a, a, a favorable outcome. So you can see here in November, this is where we are. Um, unfortunately, she's still my patient and uh, we we had a uh, uh, some minor setbacks, but her leg looks fantastic and she's actually quite pleased. I think I'll be discharging her within the next one to two weeks. So uh, every time I think back to training, especially if, if, if it cross covered uh, dermatology, I, re I remember the uh, ABCDE that you, you guys use quite often for um, melanoma and, and, and these sorts of things. So I'm, I'm this, this is hopefully something that falls in your, in your realm from a wound care perspective, right? The A would be for assessing the patient from a complete hist history standpoint and developing a plan. When you think about the plan, your plan should always include these factors. Is there a pressure offloading issue that I need to uh, uh, look at? Is there a lymphatic issue? Are the arterial and venous uh, 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 assessments performed? Is there a nutrition deficit? Then of course, B, bio burden reduction. What efforts am I gonna do to, to minimize the bio burden? C, how am I gonna transform this chronic inflammatory state into an acute one? How aggressive do I need from a debridement standpoint? And of course, edema control. The edema control is actually my very, very huge secret weapon. It saves me so many times and it's so often neglected, but most of the cases, most of the cases that I have, especially in the lower extremity where they're complicated, everyone's having a hard time. They've been there for six, seven months, a year, several years. Uh, they show up to my uh, doorstep and I implement edema control and guess what? It heals. And we'll talk about that later on as well. So yes, we know that the wound from, from a basic science standpoint, wounds any open uh, defect in the skin. And our goal as wound specialists is to uh, get that defect to close. But of course, of course, we also wanna make sure that functional restoration is also achieved so that patients can use that extremity. 
again, as I said before, you can't really do proper wound management if you're looking at tissue and you can't describe what you need to enhance versus what you need to get rid of. So within this, uh, 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 these boxes here, I just want to go through from box A to show, you know, when you look at the wound and you see this yellow sort of uh, uh, gelatinous, uh, glossy looking film that really comes off quite easily with your curette. This is biofilm. And any of the re residents that have rotated with me, we talk about biofilm all the time. And this is something that we always wanna get rid of. This doesn't take robust debridement. This is something that's just gently cleaned off, but it's present quite often. In, in box B, where we have more slothy tissue, this is tissue that is more adherent. It's not great tissue. It's not necessarily necrotic, but it's tissue that often stalls your progress. So if you're dealing with any open... <laughs> you're dealing with any open defect and you have this slothy tissue, know that it needs to be removed. And you're not gonna be able to remove this by curetting. You're gonna to need to take a scalpel and you're gonna to need to be able to uh, surgically remove this uh, uh, in a very judicious fashion. Be a minimalist like myself. Don't be too aggressive. Know just how much aggression to put into the wound. And if you've got sloppy tissue, just clean off what you need. Because again, you're trying to get to that healthy wound base. Box C is where you're looking at a beautiful, healthy, granular bed. This is the, the, the type of wound that you want in your mind. This is the goal that you're trying to achieve with any open defect. And then in box D, this is uh, where the granulation tissue has gone above and beyond. And you can see the hypergranulation that we have here. We have a number of cases where hypergranulation is involved. Sometimes it's not the entire wound bed. It might be a small section of the wound. We will address that. Sometimes I steal some of the hypergranulation and put it in an area where there's a deficit. And uh, these are uh, uh, certain techniques that we use in order to get to the next stage. So from a scope, uh, general scope, yes, most of my wounds are venous ulcers. Lots. There's not a day that goes by in my, in my world where it's not a venous ulcer. It's the most common wound care entity, 10 times more common in peripheral arterial disease. The funny thing about venous ulcers is that everyone really despises them and, and they, they find it quite difficult to heal. For me, part of the reason why only 2% of venous patients are actually developing ulcers, however, 50% of these ulcers are being present for 10 years. The problem is the management issue. Often patients are very pushy and you, you know how patients can be, right? You start an intervention that they may or may not like. And before you know it, they're trying to persuade you not to use it. Compression is one of those things, right? With a venous ulcer, if you look at all the evidence out there, if you're not compressing that patient with a, some sort of edema management, every visit, you're, you're really looking for uh, a situation where you're not gonna get them better. So I will use all kinds of sweet talks. Uh, I will give them all kinds of jokes, whatever I need to, to make sure that they stay compliant. And that's how we're able to get uh, uh, sort of a, in, in the realm of 97% success rate with these types of patients. With the pressure ulcer, with the pressure, Pressure ulcer situations, we have, um, you know, the, the data is, is actually quite good. Pressure ulcers have actually come down in terms of incidence. Lots of it relates to um, uh, consequences, you know, for hospitals and nursing facilities if a patient develops a pressure ulcer. But um, uh, the key for most of these pressure ulcers is take the patient off the ulcers and the ulcers do well. Um, and then, of course, the diabetic ulcers that we deal with, um, most of these patients, I always say, don't think about the blood sugar primarily, think more about the pressure offloading. Most of these diabetic patients have significant neuropathy, which is why a substantial amount of their uh, ulcers are on the plantar uh, aspect of their foot. It'll be, it, it, it's such a glaring defect where uh, patients are referred to me and, you know, they're wearing flip-flops, they're wearing tennis shoes, and they've been seen by podiatry, they've been seen by vascular, they've been seen by lots of people, and no one told them, hey, stop wearing those shoes. So again, everything from a, uh, in my belief, from a, from a medical uh, inclusive uh, standpoint, requires you to always target the most basic element and you will enhance your, your, your success. Um, with diabetic ulcers, of course, is a huge problem from an amputation standpoint, which is one of my passions in terms of limb salvaging. I try to save everything. All the patients know my saying, I'm allergic to amputations. You bring it to me, I'm gonna try to save it unless it doesn't really make uh, functional or clinical sense. So that's the reason why I have this slide here. Obviously, we, if we can prevent amputations, we can prevent morbidity, et cetera. Uh, wound care costs um, in the billions. 
lots of uh, patients where if they had simple wound care would save themselves amputations, would still save themselves lots of morbidity. Um, unfortunately, less than 1 million uh, patients are actually sent to wound care centers. A lot of the times, um, other clinicians, internists, et cetera, will try to manage the patients. And, um, uh, and it might be sort of like an afterthought where they might say, okay, well, maybe we'll send you to a wound specialist. The wound life cycle, we know uh, some of them improve, but most of them will fluctuate where they'll have this wax waning uh, course where sometimes it's doing better and, and, and then sometimes it just deteriorates. And our goal is to try to figure that out. This is an obligatory slide, of course, the phases of, of wound, he uh, wound healing. I always like to uh, tell the, re the residents that wound healing is actually hipper than uh, or what you may think. And that's just a good way to, re to memorize the stages of healing, hemostasis, inflammation, proliferation, uh, the proliferative phase and remodeling. Um, of course, within each of these phases, there are lots of different growth factors that are active. Um, things merge qu quite a bit, but the key phase that we're interested in is the, the inflammatory phase where uh, most wounds are thought to be stuck in. This slide here is, is, is also actually uh, rather unique. I talked to you about that ABCDE approach. And one of the things I mentioned was transforming a chronic process into an acute one. These are the components of what is happening in the acute wound versus the chronic wound. In the chronic wound, as you can see, there's a down regulation of platelet derived growth factor where that is the opposite uh, uh, scenario in the acute wound. And that's very important in hemostasis and sort of setting the wound up for uh, 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 progress in the future. In fact, some companies have actually tried to uh, make the substrate of PDGF to add it onto wounds to try to see if that would help uh, uh, enhance their healing ability. The other thing that you, you want to note here is that the, the growth factor uh, distribution within the chronic wound is also uh, offset compared to a more even distribution of growth factors, multitude of growth factors within the acute wound. Um, and then I'll also mention that for a lot of the chronic wounds, infection isn't really a big theme that I focus on per se, because these wounds have some sort of increased resistance to infection, unlike uh, your diabetic patients or the ones that are immunosuppressed, but for the, for the general uh, approach there's increased resistance to infection in chronic wounds um, than uh, compared to um, acute wounds. From a local wound factor, there's a, a, a number of factors at the wound site that impede the healing. You, someone, uh, one of your residents had just presented a case about vasculitis. This is not obviously macrovascular uh, insult. This, microva this is microvascular insult within the skin that can also lead um, uh, to uh, wounds and so forth. I've underlined most of the big ones that again play a role in terms of local insult um, that you should keep your eyes peeled for in terms of, again, edema, scarring, radiation exposure, even the topical steroids. I know dermatologists love clobetazole. I know that if I have a patient and I haven't uh, uh, looked at, um, uh, let's say, reviewed the prior history and I and I get a patient and, I, and they say, oh, what has the patient been receiving? They say clobetazole. I know I said, oh, that's one of my derm referrals. And I, I, I love clobetazole as well, but you'll see again, as we look at some of these cases, that um, certainly keep in the back of your mind that these topical steroids can be a problem and we use them in a, in a, a fairly um, limited manner if we can. The local toxins includes things like Dakin's, which I happen to love. Um, some of the more advanced products like uh, Vashi and Anisept, which we, we can also talk about, um, not as toxic, but again, with my treatment battery, it's always about balancing a little bit of insult in order to get the biggest uh, gain uh, overall. These are some of the systemic factors, as you can see, um, uh, that relate to delayed healing. The diabetes we talked about, of course, smoking, one of the big ones that uh, it's, 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 it's not as, as prevalent, which is great. Um, the pain one I put here, because sometimes my patient populations are elderly. These are stoic patients who don't want to take any pain medications. And unfortunately, their, their, their sympathetic tune is always enhanced and the constriction leads to poor uh, skin perfusion. So these are patients I try to encourage them. Listen, don't be, I don't want you suffering all the time. I do want you to have some, some pain relief so that we can get better perfusion to the skin and it will help it, it, help it also heal. The distant malignancy and uh, 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 infections and systemic steroids. Again, chemotherapeutic agents that's, uh, 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 that we have to deal with. Um, these are all things that uh, can delay the healing. And usually if it's not absolutely critical, I try to wean patients off of this in order to um, get them to heal. 
Again, we talked about how most of these chronic wounds are stuck in the pro-inflammatory state. You can see the different arms that feed into that, whether it's bacterial contamination, the repeat trauma for patients with, let's say, diabetic ulcers that are, are constantly walking on it. All of this feeds into cellular senescence. And when I talked about that first case where you really want to wake up these sleepy cells, you really want to excite them with this gentle debridement, this gentle feathering. And you, you saw the case that we started with. This, that was a very, very, very difficult case. And you saw that how um, with my debridement and so forth, it started to progress. The minute the patient stopped seeing me, she comes back in July, I start the process up and then whoop, the cells start the same, the, the, the same cascade. This is an underlying theme that you'll see throughout in terms of getting the patients to the next level. We do know that uh, these zones of senescence have actually been mapped out. There's e actually even different genes uh, that are um, uh, lit up in uh, various um, uh, locations of where the wound is, 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 is proximity to the wound. You can see here location A being close to the wound. Certain genes are firing compared to uh, as you uh, move more distant away from where the actual wound is. So there's a, a host of very complicated uh, processes that are going on that we're trying to capitalize on. This slide I call the wound 101 slide because if you memorize everything on this slide and you approach every wound for the most part, looking at this or trying to address each of these, you will do fantastic. You should be in the 85 to 90% success rate, um, just focusing on, on, on these elements here. For the pressure offloading, this is a little bit of a pet peeve of mine because it's so easy. And, and, and patients losing their foot, losing toes, losing a lot of uh, uh, morbidity just from not knowing what to put the patient in to offload them. Lots of our, um, uh, of course, uh, the ER residents also rotate uh, with us. And a lot of the times, you know, a lot of our ERs will give out post-op shoes. Um, these, they're inexpensive, $5, $10, somewhere. But if you have a patient with a plantar wound, it's really not the way to go. And you'll see in the next slide what to look at. Remember from all the pressure ulcers we talked about, we uh, caught quite often you'll hear patients having to do Q1, two hour <clears throat> log rolls. That's very difficult. It's all about the surface that they're on. So make sure that they're on low air loss mattresses, these sorts of things. Avoid donut cushions. If you happen to get a patient who's sitting on a donut cushion, it's counterintuitive, but they're, they're terrible. They actually um, uh, don't lead to healing. They actually lead to actual ulcers uh, forming. Um, the item here, this boot, this is a, a cam boot, and this is actually um, what we typically try to get the patient in if they can afford it, but we have alternatives, which I'll show you on this slide here. I love this slide because if you look on the, ax the X axis, these are all the different types of offloading modalities that you have. And certainly my slides are available to, to, to you all, so you can always have them. And then on this Y axis, you can see all the different places where ulcers can occur. If I cross out just the ones for you to memorize, you can see that for a dorsal foot ulcer, the only thing that's appropriate, only thing, is the post-op shoe. Because that makes sense, right? With this a dorsal foot ulcer, you're, you're having, by using the post-op shoe, you're basically getting proper offloading of that aspect. It's not appropriate for anything else. So patients with plantar ulcers and you're using a post-op shoe, not really the way to go. Um, there are other cheaper modalities like ortho wedges that cost like $26, $27, $30 that patients can use to offload these areas as well. But you can see for the most part, the gold standard for offloading um, uh, everything aside from the dorsal uh, foot ulcer is a total contact cast. Now, unfortunately, less than 2% of wound centers use the total contact cast. So that cam boot that I talked about earlier is in this category, but it's also equally efficacious. The only difference is that patients um, with the, the cam boot can take it off where they can't take off the cast, which is why the cast is so, so much better. In terms of the uh, vascular assessment, of course, you want to uh, ensure all your patients that you're going to, especially if I'm telling you all to be attentive to edema in, in every capacity. If you want to compress them, you also want to make sure that they can tolerate the compression. So by ensuring that the patients have had uh, an arterial duplex to make sure that there's no occlusions, um, we found many patients who've had stents and then we do an arterial duplex. We find that the stents collapse and then they go back. We send them back to vascular for, for um, uh, uh, um, a revascularization and then they do uh, a lot better. But be conscious about um, the vascular status. Do a peripheral vascular exam. Document your 
your uh, 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 PT, DP, cap refill, warm feet, all of those things, especially from a legal standpoint, will allow you to be able to document that the ABI is at least 0.7, which means that it's appropriate for proper compression. But these are, again, very basic things that will give you huge gains um, for, for healing. The um, edema control, as I mentioned before, one of the most often neglected. Um, some patients uh, will even, they, they've got scant amount of edema. They say, oh, I've never had edema ever. Some of them have robust edema. Say, oh, I've never had edema uh, ever. But you want to be hyper vigilant. If you see a hint of edema, you want to get rid of it with some form of compression. And um, well, we do use the Unaboot quite often. Um, it's a very well tolerated. It was actually you know, uh, made by dermatologist uh, Dr. Paul Una. And um, it's very, very comfortable, and most patients uh, enjoy uh, using it. We, when, from an elevation standpoint, if the patient cannot tolerate compression, we do tell them we want their legs elevated. We typically say have it just parallel to the ground. We don't want it necessarily, you know, uh, feet above the heart, toes to the nose. Level to the ground is just perfect and gives us just as much benefit um, uh, from, from an, an edema reduction standpoint. Again, the many benefits of uh, uh, compression, I can this slide can be very, very busy, as you can see, not just from edema re um, reduction. Look at the effects on the microcirculation and cytokines. I mean, this is phenomenal. And when we get into the cases, I will show you cases where the, the it, it's not even a wound case. It's, 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 I, I would classify it, classify it more as a dermatology case that I happen to inherit. And I put the patient in one week of compression and something that's been there for six months goes away in a week week. So these are, these are the kind of things that um, uh, your compression will really, really um, uh, benefit. Um, in terms of lifelong compression, obviously, if the patient has venous ulcers, um, you want to ensure that they're using compression stockings for life. Uh, most of the time, the standard recommendation is 30, millis 30 millimeters of mer mercury. Um, most patients have difficulty putting the stockings on. Use your discretion. Maybe consider halving that 15 millimeters of mercury, something like that. For me, I always say something is better than nothing. Um, if the patient's younger, stronger, yes, you should try, try it to get them into the standard. For lymphedema, the number is actually higher, is 50 to 60. Um, uh, millimeters of mercury, but for venous hypertension, it's on the lower side. If you're dealing with a patient who has lots of, uh, uh, let's say, peripheral uh, vasculitic lesions on the legs, and they've also got the edema that I'm now telling you is a disaster, and you want to get them to compression, uh, put them in something. Again, you can always turn the volume up, start them gradual, and see how the lesions behave. And again, you'll be very, very uh, hopefully surprised in the favorable direction. From a debridement standpoint, there are a multitude of things in, in wound care. Uh, lots of you guys are exposed to the disposable curette here. Again, debridement is, there's gradations of debridement. Again, not all debridement is robust, but that light feathering, that light stimulation in a wound that you happen to be treating and it's not doing well. I've had times where dermatology might come down to my office. We have lots of dermatologists in our, in our building. Might come down to, you know, Caesar, I've been dealing with this wound. It's not moving anywhere. Um, I says, how's the debridement process going on? Well, I debrid it every so often. So, ah, debrid it every, every time you see her. Just give her a little bit more gentle stimulation. And guess what? It heals, okay? So... Uh, it sounds simple, but I'm, I'm being completely honest with you in terms of how effective these methodologies are, okay? Yes, we have lots of other um, enzymatic debridement agents. I don't typically use that. It takes a, a bit on the longer side. I don't typically use the maggot therapy unless I'm pushed by a patient because they, they want maggots on them. Uh, <laughs> it sounds funny, but I've, I've had a, a number of patients who, Dr. Anderson, when are you going to use the maggots on me? But um it's not, it's not necessarily uh, something we push for. Uh, and uh, again, some of the uh, dressings have really great uh, uh, debridement potential. Even the basic, yes, it's a surgical dressing, the wet to dry, but when used judiciously, it, it really has a role uh, in, in, in moving things forward. These are all the agents here. Back when I was in training, the papain-based agents were fantastic, but uh, they've been pulled off the market because of a, uh, some bad anaphylactic reactions and, and only one collagenase is really on the market. Um, again, I don't use them very often. They have no antimicrobial activity. They take forever. I can do a, a, a debridement in 10 seconds that it'll take two uh, weeks or, or a month for, for a collagenase. So it's it's usually not high on my, my use list. This is a new product that just sort of hit the U.S. market that um, 
Um, it's in a, a, apparently its own category where it's it's classified as a debridement agent, um, uh, where basically it it, it has this um, it has antimicrobial ability, but it also allows uh, some maximum absorption of these um, uh, uh, microbes and we'll see, we'll see how it works out, but uh, it's something to keep your, your eye out on. Now, in terms of wound care dressings, lots of them. Obviously, this is not something that we can cross uh, uh, in any meaningful uh, level. And I tell everyone that, listen, there's a thousand ways to skin a cat. No particular one dressing is the best dressing. What is important is knowing when to use the dressing, right? What's important is when you look at the wound bed, figuring out what you need to do in order to get it to the next stage. Um, you can see we've been been using animal fat, honey, these things have, have also been uh, used, but the goal is to maintain a moist environment. And that moist environment is what really excites the wound and gets the wound to the next stage. I can, of course, make this slide very busy because once you maintain a moist environment, epidermal growth factor, fibroblast growth factor, VEGF, all the, all, all the components that are very important for healing is augmented. Chemical signaling is much better and you get a, a, a much uh, more efficient healing. Lots of patients will say, especially the elderly patients, oh, Dr. Anderson, I always thought you keep the wound to keep the wound dry. I, I'll even have some, some young doctors say, I thought hey, keeping it dry was the way to go, let it breathe. This is not the way to go. A moist environment, and moist doesn't mean wet. It just means um, an environment that um, uh, is, is, is not uh, very dry and just has some, some uh, balance uh, where this chemical signaling is, is enhanced. From an antimicrobial standpoint, yes, we have lots of antimicrobials out there. They usually fall in two flavors in wound care, silver versus iodine. Um, I use the iodine more for the patients that I meet initially. It's a very, very uh, nice formulation where I can get good uh, biofilm reduction and antimicrobial coverage over the entire week because most patients, again, we're not changing their dressing every day. They're being changed on a weekly basis. The longer the dressing stays in place, the better. A lot of times people want to change dressings every day, not the way to go, unless there's a heavy exudate. And even for that, we have different uh, approaches where you're not really tampering with the wound bed every single day and you give it time so that it can repopulate. Um, you see my Dakin's there, the acetic acid. I like both of those things. I use it. <laughs> there's probably not a week that doesn't go by where I'm not using that in a limited fashion. It is toxic, so it's not all the time. Um, but it's very, very effective. The acetic acid is great for pseudomonas, um, but um, you can see here, this is also a very big staple in my uh, practice, Mupirocin. I know dermatology loves that as well, which is always a, a big smile on my face, but Mupirocin is a fantastic agent. We don't like bacitracin. We don't like neosporin. We don't like polymixin. We don't like triple N. We don't like anything else. Mupirocin, as the name imply, Mupure right? You do not have a situation where you can get cross-contamination um, from a lot of the other additives. You have a patient who you put a neosporin on and all of a sudden they've got some redness. Is it contact dermatitis? Is it an infection? You have no idea. The Pearson, I don't see that. Not to mention also great for MRSA coverage. It's just a fantastic agent. Coupled with the zero forms, very synergistic. Again, we're, we're not changing dressings every day. So I want something to last. So if we have a cut, we have a laceration, we have an open wound that is not severe. I'm putting the Pearson on the wound base. I'm covering with the zero form and I'm telling them not to touch it for seven days. If it's a high use area like the hand where it's very difficult, then fine. They'll change it maybe every two or three days if, if, if that's what they're, they're left up to. But just understand this, these two combinations, fantastic. Okay, let's transition into cases and, and so forth. Let's say we, we you do all of that and uh, you start running into a situation where the wound is not getting any better. Um, certainly, again, be sure to double check for the things that could bite you, i.e. residual cancer. And I've had a couple of cases where uh, we have a, a few patients who've had most procedures and um, uh, sometimes you get residual disease, it, it, it happens, or they've had you know, other diagnoses and you've got residual cancer, uh, plastics patients where they had breast cancer, the wound is still present and uh, there's another malignancy that has uh, uh, erupted. So understand that skin cancer certainly can mimic uh, uh, chronic wounds, but usually it should have a certain characteristic to it. Lots of times, you know, the, the edges are raised, you know, they're, they're uh, but it's not always the case. You can have um, uh, points where the uh, wound is basically um, looks like a classic uh, uh, wound ulcer. Um, so uh, certainly consider biopsy if you're uncertain. I'm very sort of, um, 
I'm not a huge biopsy. Uh, 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 my threshold is high, put it that way, because again, I, I, I don't want to add lots of complexity and wounds, wounds don't respond, cancerous wounds don't respond favorably all the time to wound care. Let's put it that way. You don't cure cancer with wound care. So if I have a high index of suspicion and I'm, and I'm, I'm treating the patient and they're not getting better with all the things that I'm doing, that's always a red flag to me. And then that's the time where I might go in and do either a shave biopsy um, where I can get a, you know, a little bit less sampling error. And um, usually that works out um, uh, where the, it, it, it comes back positive. So keep that in the back of your mind, okay? Um, yes, uh, there are uh, some advanced modalities, of course, wound vax, we have it all, cellularized tissue products, we have it, cadaver grafts, hyperbarics, lots of patients, uh, uh, you know, lots of clinicians will say, gee, you know, Dr. Anderson, how are you getting all these uh, fantastic, uh, you know, effect? Are you putting everyone in the chamber? And I'm telling you right now, uh, like 98% of all my patients in the hyperbaric chamber are not wound patients. Okay, most of them are radiation patients. The wound patients I put in the chamber are diabetics with uh, crazy entities going on, but very, very, very few of my patients in the hyperbaric chamber are wound patients. Um, you can see here all the different modalities and we'll go over. This one here is alloderm. This one here is apograph. You can see the wound back and of course our chamber. So what I want you to understand again is goes back to this whole inf inflammation, right? Inflammation equals hypoxia and hypoxia is, is an absolute uh, uh, impediment to any forms of healing, whether there's an open wound, which is what I love, but as I said before, I get a, a crossover with derm cases. And, um, and, and again, once I see lots of inflammation, um, I, I know 100% hypoxia uh, is, is uh, uh, present and our goal is to change that, okay? So inflammation is hypoxic. It's been well established for, for, for decades. I told you before, edema, edema, edema. If there's anything you get out of this talk, respect edema and look for it. Even if you see a hint of it, if everyone in the room says, well, there's just a little bit, say, guess what? I'm going to go after it. I describe it as evil because I always make the joke and I say, guys, would you even want a teaspoon of evil for your loved ones? And the answer usually is no. Okay. <laughs> for, for the, usually. So if you have anyone with a little bit of edema and no one's managing it, you will save the day. You will save the day because again, a substantial amount of my patients, it, it, no one has put them in any, uh, edema, has any, put any effort in terms of edema reduction. And that goes across all specialties. We implement it and guess what? The wounds transform and they get better. You can see here, um, just from a graphic standpoint, the more edema you have, the more sort of intercapillary distance that that patient had, that, that, that the nutrients have to, to uh, travel. And again, it also leads to uh, uh, tissue hypoxia. Um, this is another slide talking about hypoxia and infection. When wounds are more hypoxic, they're more infected. Everything to try to promote oxygenation um, uh, in the wound is the way to go, okay? So let's look at these cases. Um, we're gonna keep in the back of your mind, again, this whole ABCD approach. Everything I talked about in terms of uh, making sure perfusion, debridement, offloading, all of that is gonna come into play. All of that I, I'm doing so that um, uh, for us to get these outcomes. Here's that first case I told you that's so dramatic, right? This patient had this lesion, it looks like some sort of a contact dermatitis, um, or uh, you know the the, uh, the the dermatological lingo, but it had been present for oh, gosh six months, seven months, and this patient had been through lots of clobetazole, lots of different topical ointments. Nothing worked. Look at the date here. Okay, one week, one week. I put the patient in compression. It heals just one week. And uh, on top of the, um, for a topical, I use like a topical triamcinolone. I put a topical triamcinolone. I put uh, a zero form, uh, uh, maybe over the wound defect, put them in like an owner boot, wait a week, they come back in a week. Oh, no one has done that for me, Dr. Anderson. And the lesion is gone. That's pretty dramatic. I want it to hopefully stick in your mind as as, as an entity to, to keep in mind. This is a patient with lots of, um, as you can see, papillomatosis. Uh, the, the toes look like this. The legs look like this. And um, this is a patient, again, um, we use a, a novel approach, um, salsa blue shampoo. Um, and um, 
basically we were able to uh, get this patient to uh, denude all of that uh, uh, skin and uh, the skin looked fantastic. A very easy approach. They take the shampoo, they make a rich lather, they leave it on the legs for about 10 minutes, they rinse it off, they do that every day and, and, and it helps uh, to denude the, the skin. Here's another case here. You can see Unitho syndrome. This patient, I, I, I had both the, um, the, the uh, brother and sister, um, significant uh, 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 hyperkeratosis in the, on, on the hands and the feet. Again, we use the cells in blue. This time, instead of 10 minutes, a movie, watch a movie, two, uh, two hours leaving cells in blue on their hand. And you can see uh, the effect here. And this is a patient who's been through lots of different uh, uh, treatments uh, per derm to try to get that to uh, peel off and, and nothing had worked. Um, so this is, was pretty dramatic. Patient was very happy. Um, and this is something they can do, um, uh, you know, infinitum. Now, here's some scalp cases. This is an elderly uh, a patient of mine who, uh, somewhere in the 80s, 89 years old or so, had squamous cell carcinoma, lots of radiation. I inherited her back in, on, in 2018, as you can see there, um, the bones exposed. You can see that she's, she also has some greenish discoloration. Pseudomonas has been involved. And we get lots of, of, of cases like this, whether it be from surgery, dermatology, where the bones exposed and everyone's like, uh, what's the next step here? So uh, what I want you to see is that even though there's portions that, especially the darker portions here that are necrotic, these are areas we're going to, we're going to watch. And for patients like this, I have um, what I call a three tiered system. Okay. Typically when I get them for the first time and the, the, the wound is heavily burdened with, with colonization and dead bone, I will put them on a Dakin's regimen every day they will and i teach every single one of them they love it it's easy and these are for patients again who tell me dr anderson i want the conservative route i don't want you to send me to neurosurgery plastics for them to do burrs and all these sorts of things if they choose the conservative route this is what we do all the time i've been doing this for decades it works and it's simple okay we do dakin's wet to dry every single day for the first month they will continue to change the wet to dry dressing on their scalp we will put typically around the, uh, the, the exposed skin areas um, uh, zinc oxide just to help protect that normal skin and not so it does not get wet from the uh, Dakins. And um, typically they'll do that just to help clean off uh, the initial bio burden. And as they're doing that, some chips, some of the bone will actually start to fall off. It's, it's pretty dramatic. Now, her case is, is, is bad, and I'll show you some other cases, but uh, the bone will start to fall off. And um, she actually developed, as you can see, a couple of years later, this um, uh, lesion here uh, that I thought may have been a recurrent cancer. I, I did biopsy it, sent it, and, and turns out that it was not a, a, a cancer. And um, so we continue with the process. But Typically, they will do Dakin's wet to dry on a daily basis. They do that for a month. And then after that, I will downgrade them to a low-grade therapeutic option where they're using the Puricin just on the bone covered by a zero-form dressing. And again, you know, a lot of the patients, either they wear a wig or a baseball cap and they go on with their life. I see them periodically in the, big, in the beginning, maybe every initially every week, then every two weeks, every three weeks, I push them out every three months, every six months. And before you know it, I'm seeing them maybe once a year, okay? And you're going to see a dramatic change for this patient. So from 2020 um, all the way through 2022, you still see the bone. Nothing's changed. She's living a happy life. The only things that sometimes will happen is around the interface between healthy tissue and bone, you'll get some purulent uh, pockets. Those purulent pockets, I take a simple uh, uh, pickup and I essentially debride those pockets. I remove those pockets. If there's purulent pockets, I tell the patient, listen, we're gonna backtrack. We go back to the high grade. They'll go back to using the Dakins once a day. Anytime they have significant changes like pain in, in, in on the skin or purulent drainage, they go back to the Dakins and they'll do that for about another two weeks before downgrading back to the low grade um, of Mepiracin and zero form option. After they survive a, a Mepiracin and zero form option for let's say a month with no issues, we downgrade them to Aquaphor and they just put Aquaphor over the uh, the bone and the interface of the skin and they and that's how they're maintained. So you can see, I, I mentioned the, the, the lesion I was concerned about and uh, uh, these areas, again, I'm also debriding uh, where the arrow is 
um, and, and sometimes you can get some dried uh, skin that's uh, pretty um, easy to, to uh, remove uh, following that. And then you can see up to now, you know, I, I see her uh, periodically, uh, look how much bone has gone. This is all skin, folks. Okay, so we've got the Dakin's uh, regimen, this the Pearson regimen, the Aquaphor maintenance regimen, all the dried bone gets brittle enough that uh, it starts to fall off and skin forms itself. And essentially she, she does have still some bone here, but you can only imagine how elated she is. This is someone that when we first had the interview, I told her, I said, listen, uh, this is not something that we're planning on healing. This is a conservative route and we'll see how it goes. But sometimes even a severe patient gets to a point where skin will repopulate, okay? <clears throat> now, this is another patient here. This is more palliative, again, where she, uh, essentially, she had a basal cell in her forehead. She was from Hawaii, ignored it for, for years. She, it started as a pimple, her daughters and kids, mom, get it treated, ignored it, ignored it, ignored it, and it turned into this disaster. Um, she was also an herbalist. She didn't really believe in medicine, didn't want to see doctors. Eventually, she did decide to go in, um, uh, and she was uh, put on uh, 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 chemotherapy, um, and she agreed to get the um, uh, uh, wound care and follow our directions. Um, most of my palliative wounds, I always go with Dakin's wet to dry. The family loves it because the odor, everything just gets wiped out the same day. And it's an easy dressing because they're just doing a wet to dry changing. And that wet to dry is performing mechanical debridement. It's cleaning everything. Okay. And over time, if coupled with the right chemo agent, if coupled with the right immunotherapy, if coupled with radiation, if coupled with any of those things, success, it's going to heal. It, it's, it's, you know, over time, my, my um, sort of attitude towards things that, that uh, are apparently not uh, detrimental to the point where it's never going to heal. I, I could not say never anymore. There's only a few cases where I could say never. But here's her lesion. She's got the uh, 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 chemotherapy working. And of course, it's basal cell. They respond very well. And uh, you can see over time, we're using the Dakin. She's doing fantastic. Unfortunately, she decides to stop the Dakin. So she starts using some sort of essential oregano oils and so forth. And then I give her, a, we have a little fight in the office. And then eventually she's like, okay, fine, I'll go back to it. And then um, she starts getting, again, a, a fantastic outcome here. And she goes on and she does very well. She did have two little sinus tracts here um, because the cancer had, 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 had you know, been quite uh, invasive. And uh, those tracts actually epithelialized, but they never closed over. But you can see the, the, from, from where she was to where she is now, uh, pretty fantastic. This is another case here of a young girl, uh, I'll never forget her, um, who had a um, stage four melanoma. Um, she would come in, her little daughter sitting on the side uh, um, during her visit, and she could hardly move her neck. She was always in this sort of a contracted position. And this cancer had some odor. Um, it had a small little cavity on the on the, the uh, uh, top portion here. And I, I asked her, I said, well, you know, I, I wonder why um, she'd been on multiple chemo trials. I said, why don't they just debulk it, right? Why don't just get rid of it? And I thought it wasn't debulked because maybe the carotid was involved. Um, so we pushed for her to, to uh, go back to surgery, uh, head and neck, and then have them debulk it. Um, initially, they were quite reluctant, but then um, I said, well, push, push, push. And then eventually they do do it. But in the meantime, that cavity at the top, I, I opened, okay? And I was able to get the Dakin's packed into that defect. Prior to packing it, I took my curette and I actually cleaned out a lot of the dead cancer, a lot of the uh, 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 sort of... Uh, um, slothy necrotic tissue that was in there that had all this odor um, and uh, basically were able to pack it. She was able to pack it herself and she had a big bandaid on her, on her neck. She came back after the surgical consult and, uh, <clears throat> and we pushed for the, the uh, debulking and they finally said, okay, fine, we'll do it. They debulked it. She had this open defect here. This is someone who was given six months to live. Um, we continued to uh, debride the area gently um, uh, 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 each visit, and she goes on. And even that defect, this is melanoma, okay? Uh, you can see the base of it starts to granulate, right, <laughs> with these same principles, and she goes on and it heals. And now, you know, she can walk outside confident, you know, enjoy the rest of her life at 31 uh, until uh, her final moments. But this is, this is, this is a, a, a palliative approach that we took, again, from a wound healing perspective. This is a patient who 
basically had a squamous cell carcinoma in situ, um, had it resected, and you see the defect here on the scalp, and this is a liver transplant patient um, uh, who's immunocompromised, and basically this patient ends up uh, following the procedure, um, obviously they couldn't close it, and ends up getting a skin graft, a full thickness skin graft placed on one of the more novel, um, sort of novel in that it's gained a, a bit more momentum uh, lately. Uh, but this is a product that was maybe about seven, eight years they, they, they came out, but it's a, a omega-3 fatty acid product, fish product that uh, you can put over bone uh, uh, to help heal. And this patient gets, you know, sort of this, um, you know, advanced modality. He has the graft placed over there. And you can see the grafted site here, the full thickness graft that um, has been placed here, starts to look a little bit slothy. It's not looking really that healthy. And uh, eventually, you can see that the graft, um, excuse me, actually ulcerates. And uh, we're back to almost square one. Uh, uh, within this defect. So I inherit the patient um, at this point. And I want you to, again, pay attention to debridement, the power of debridement, right? We inherit the patient on the 27th of March, same day, okay? Look at the difference, same day. The same day when you look after uh, removing uh, uh, the biofilm and really exciting the tissue, you get this red population here that you're really augmenting, okay? then. Uh, within the month, this is the same process that we're doing. Gentle debridement and removing uh, the biofilm and transforming the, the wound into a more active process. Patient had some minor hypergranulation on the, on the uh, edge here. I cauterized that. But again, uh, look, at, look at the transformation just with some debridement. And then again, the same process. The 19th, patient has a little bit of some biofilm. I will gently debride that. And you can see the wound is responding very, very well, okay? And the patient moves on to a point where eventually they close. My point again is that these are the, the sort of methodologies, very, very, very effective in implementing these gentle debridements to wake up those senescent cells so you can get favorable healing. This is a patient with lower extremity ulcer, um, vascular inflow problems. Um, so we, we monitored initially, uh, re-necrosis, as you can see here, not doing well following uh, the two most procedures. I ended up putting the alloderm on this patient. This is my cadaver graft. It's actually my, my secret weapon. Um, suture this on. And then again, the patient's getting some light compression. If I can't put any compression, I'm pushing for him or her to keep their legs up. And you can see, again, this is a, a fairly easy case in that um, the, the alloderm will, will, will fixate. And um, over time, it gets smaller and smaller and goes, and the patient goes on, even in a tapered leg that has a very, very uh, minimal inflow, will go on and, and heal. This uh, last case here is a patient that was, um, that had, as you can see here, multiple recurrent basal cell carcinomas on the nose. She was sent to me because this flap, this pyramidian flap here, was actually dying. They wanted her in the hyperbaric chamber. Obviously, the chamber couldn't save this, is already sort of dead, as you can see here. Um, and, 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 and this happened pretty quickly, as you can see. Um, in, 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 in any event, I did resect that tissue. And uh, this flap here, eventually I'm gonna cut off. She's obviously got the um, uh, essentially iatrogenic site from where the flap was harvested, but she's got this open defect here. This patient's in her eighties. So, and everything we're doing here, we're doing in the office, right? So she's sitting in a, an office chair, gets to hear my lovely jokes and smiling. And we're doing this procedure um, uh, at the bedside. So I take my alloderm again, this is a cadaver graft, okay? Um, which is pretty much like a, a robust scaffold. I suture it on after cutting it to size, uh, the site that was, was harvested. This site here, I'm gonna cut off. And when I cut it off, because it's so superficial, I'm gonna put me Pearson zero form cover dressing and it's gonna stay there for seven days. And then you can see, I actually grafted her nose okay graft her, her entire nose and then as you can see here the way we babysit the graft is we put the puricin over the graft and we put zero form over it and it stays and, and when the patient comes back in a week we take it off we reapply and we basically follow the patient this is one week after the application of the um, of the graft she still has the sutures we typically leave the sutures in for about two weeks and then you'll see uh, here, this is two weeks after, things are integrating very, very well. Um, you can see this site here, uh, again, where the flap was, is also doing very well. And then uh, this is her outcome.
right? When you look at her nose, quite often, if I present this slide to the plastic surgeon, they say, oh yeah, we see the grafts you know, here. It's like, no, no, this is a split thickness that was done years and years earlier. We grafted her whole nose. And from a scar standpoint, I mean, the outcome is fantastic, right? And this is someone, again, no anesthesia risks, nothing, all at the bedside. Uh, she was ex com completely uh, ecstatic about it. And then, um, again, even from a histological standpoint, you know, the architecture of, of the graft compared to, you know, the, 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 the surrounding scar tissue, you know, is it, it, phenomenal um, in, in terms of how well it, it integrated uh, with her. And it's a, it's a procedure that, again, at, at the bedside takes me no more than 10, 15 minutes, depending on how large the area is. And the patients, uh, I'm going to say probably high 90s in terms of percentage the outcome is always like this. So these are, you know, using advanced modalities, but again, these advanced modalities are sort of nestled in the basics. The basics really, really, really matter. And I have even at this point, a number of cases, um, you know, with some odd vasculitic lesions where um, this current patient has like multiple dark black ischemic lesions on her legs that I'm treating that have been there for quite some time, highly painful and so forth. And we're gingerly cleaning it off, gingerly applying these principles micro debridement, not causing a robust insult to the tissue so that the tissue has enough ability to propagate, make granular, make a granular bed. And the minute that granulation bed starts, even if there's tendon there, which I usually want to get rid of, I'm going to graft her. And once I graft, we babysit, we watch, usually heals. Where's the wood? But uh, essentially, this is uh, uh, where, where we are with wound care. And I'm, I'll love to answer any questions you have.